All right, I see Neil already has turned his camera on uh, for the sake of time. Uh, let's, let's thank Josh one last time uh, and hand things over to Neil, who will be talking to us about quantifying the effect of lunar topography on global 21 centimeter cosmology analysis for DAPR. Uh, let me restart my video timer for you, Neil, and take it away. Your slides look good. Great, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be kind of continuing this thread of talks about global 21 centimeter cosmology from the moon. Uh, but rather than talk about kind of the theoretical side as Joshua focused on, uh, I'm gonna talk about more about modeling uh, the actual observations that we're gonna get uh, from the lunar far side. So I wanna begin by noting that basically all of these low frequency instruments that we use to do global 21 centimeter cosmology have extremely large beams. And so by beams, I just mean uh, the sensitivity of the instruments to different portions of the sky. Uh, and so these very large beams are by design because we're trying to measure the sky averaged uh, component of the signal. Um, but it also means that these instruments are going to be sensitive uh, to effects from objects that are very far away from the zenith or the pointing of the instrument. Um, and so one of these effects that can potentially have an effect on observations is uh, the horizon. And so uh, we can really, you know, kind of uh, break the effect of the horizon into two different uh, pieces on the two main components of these observations. The first is the 21 centimeter signal itself. Uh, and basically this is pretty simple. It's just going to be you know, attenuated by some factor that depends on the portion of the sky that's blocked by the horizon. Uh, but the effect of the horizon on the foreground component of these observations is a little bit more complicated. And this is because the foreground emission is centered around, the, is you know, concentrated in the plane of the galaxy, uh, which is going to move across the sky in time. So this means that uh, in addition to a frequency dependent effect, uh, the horizon can also introduce uh, additional time dependence into the observations. So in order to illustrate this effect in a more kind of quantitative manner, I'm going to use as an example, these two different horizons that you see in the top panel. Uh, so the first is uh, the horizon as seen from the site of the edges instrument. So this is located in uh, the outback in Western Australia. And then the other is just a perfectly flat horizon, which is uh, given by that dashed black line that you can see. So what you're seeing in this animation in the top panel uh, is a simulation of the sky as seen from the location of the edges instrument. Um, and so again, you can see the, the plane of the galaxy is very bright and it's rotating around uh, the south celestial pole, which is indicated by that white dot uh, in the center of the map there. And so then in the bottom panel, uh, what's plotted there is a residual brightness so this is the difference between two simulated observations, one using that edges horizon, which was the blue line in the previous plot, uh, and one using a perfectly flat horizon. So this curve is essentially the bias that's introduced in the foreground component by the horizon. So you can kind of think of this as how wrong you would be if you thought the horizon was flat, but it was actually the edges horizon. And so the first thing that I'll point out about uh, this residual is that uh, you'll note on the y-axis, the scale is in Kelvin. So this is, you know, orders of magnitude larger than the magnitude of the 21 centimeter signal, which is the thing that we really care about, uh, which is expected to be at most in, you know, the hundreds of millikelvin. So even just the residual that's imposed by the horizon is much, much larger than the signal itself. So this is clearly a very large effect. Um, so you'll also note that while the frequency dependence uh, is pretty simple. It's pretty close to a power law. And this is because most of the foreground emission uh, is just synchrotron radiation. Uh, but the, you can see that there's this complex time dependence. So when the point of the galaxy is very close to the horizon, uh, this residual is going to be maximized. And when uh, the point of the galaxy is either far above or below the horizon in the sky, uh, the residual will be minimized. And you can see this effect a little bit better in this format. So this is basically the same information that's plotted here. Uh, it's just in this form of a waterfall plot. So the horizontal axis here is still frequency, uh, but now the vertical axis shows the time dependence of that residual that was plotted in the previous slide. And so here you can really see that complex time dependence. So right around one hour LST uh, is right where the, gal the point of the galaxy is very close to the horizon. That's when this residual is going to be maximized. Uh, and then you can see this, you know, it changes quite a bit as we move down vertically uh, through time. And so uh, why this is so important is because using our analysis pipeline that we use to extract the 21 centimeter signal uh, from these observations, uh, we found that we can't simply average all of our data together. 
in order to get a precision extraction of the 21 centimeter signal, uh, we actually have to uh, fit multiple time bins simultaneously. So that means that rather than averaging uh, all of this together to create just a simple you know, kind of function of frequency, we have to model this full two-dimensional image of this waterfall plot, actually. And also, uh, I want to know if the observations include polarization measurements, such as the four Stokes parameters. Um, and this is something that's going to be provided uh, by the Lucy Dapper instrument suite that you've heard some about uh, from the previous talks. Uh, this space that we have to model essentially uh, is basically four of these, these different waterfall plots, one for each of the four Stokes polarization parameters. And so this makes it even a more difficult problem uh, to kind of adequately model the effect of the horizon on observations. So now the question becomes, you know, how do, how do we include uh, the horizon and our observations to an adequate level to still get uh, <clears throat> a precise extraction of the 21 centimeter signal? And so one way that you could you know, model the horizon is to actually go to the site where you're making these observations and make direct measurements uh, of the shape of the horizon. And so that's what you're seeing with these orange dots in this top panel here. Uh, so these were direct measurements that were made from a site uh, in the Green Bank Radio Observatory, uh, it, which is in West Virginia. But you know, making these direct measurements can be pretty time consuming. And it also could be difficult uh, to do for a location where we can't uh, actually you know, physically go to, such as a, a, a lunar experiment. So we developed this code that we call shapes, uh, which is publicly available. You can see the, the GitHub link there and you can check it out yourself. Uh, and so what shapes can do is actually calculate uh, the profile of the apparent horizon uh, from any location on Earth or the moon uh, using elevation data. And so you can see here uh, in the blue line is one of these uh, <coughs> horizon profiles that was calculated using the shapes code. Uh, and it's for, so we calculated it for the same location uh, that these direct measurements were made. So if you compare the two, you can see that they mostly match up except for a few key locations where there's some major discrepancies. Um, but from looking at photos from the site, basically all of these major discrepancies are due to trees or vegetation or other objects such as buildings. Uh, and this is because the elevation data often doesn't take these things into account. And so uh, the profile that you calculate with the shapes code isn't going to include these things like trees. So in addition to the difficulty in including them in the shape of the profile, uh, trees and vegetation also present you know, another difficulty for modeling because they may interact with the incoming radiation uh, in complex ways that may be difficult to model. Uh, but one thing I want to point out is that uh, luckily for us, the moon uh, is free of these things like trees or other human uh, made obstructions. And so this is just another reason why the far side is this really excellent platform for performing these low frequency observations. So really quickly, I just want to show um, one of the horizon profiles uh, that was calculated with the shapes code from uh, a potential landing site on the far side of the moon. So this is from a site near the center of the Schrodinger crater. Uh, and so this was generated using uh, elevation data from the LRO LOLA instrument, uh, which has been really great for doing this kind of analysis. And so finally, I just want to uh, actually show some actual examples uh, of, of signal extractions using our analysis pipeline and to illustrate you know, why the horizon is so important. So in this top panel here is when we've modeled the horizon incorrectly. And so you can see that we get a really poor fit and a wildly inaccurate extraction uh, of the signals. The black is the input here and the blue uh, is what we get out of our pipeline. But then in the bottom panel, you see when we actually model the horizon uh, and effect of the horizon correctly, we get this really clean and precise extraction of the signal. So this is just to show you know, why the horizon is so important, especially when we use our, you know, analysis pipeline for analyzing these observations. So yeah, thanks, I'll just uh, leave it my conclusions and yeah, just leave it there. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that great talk, Neil. Um, I encourage uh, uh, folks to put questions in the chat and while people are typing, I'll take my chair's prerogative to ask my question. Um, so based on your shapes code and your ability to model the horizon, is it still better to just have a flat horizon with few features or are you able to model the horizon to a precision sufficient enough that, that you don't require a, an ideally flat horizon? Yeah, I would say more important than having a flat horizon is just having a horizon that you can model very precisely. Um, 
So, you know, the shape is not too important. It's just important that you, that you know it really well. So I think the ideal place is something that is free of, of trees or other objects um, that might complicate, you know, knowing that horizon to a really, really precise level. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, we have a place just like that called the moon. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Uh, for the sake of time, I think, uh, uh, well, Nividita had a question in the chat, uh, which, I'll, which I'll read. Uh, when you showed the signal ex extracted incorrectly, if the horizon effect was not taken into account, was that done for a 24-hour averaged signal? No. So that was done for um, a fit with 10 different time bins. Um, so yeah, so that wasn't with just like a, where we average all the data together. That's where we do um, kind of the fits that we found work the best for our pipeline, which is where we're fitting multiple uh, bin spectra simultaneously. All right, great. Thank you, Neil.